What if I told you that in the midst of normal life like this, a war is happening? But this isn't a war like you may be used to. No. It's not fought with today's weapons of war. Or yesterday's weapons of war. No. Instead, it's an invisible war. It's behind the scenes. It's under the surface. And yet it's very, very real. Spiritual warfare is a reality, but we often live unprepared for it. Losing the battle without even realizing it's going on. But not anymore. Scripture is clear about this. The devil wants to steal, kill, and destroy. And through God's word, we learn how the devil seeks to attack us. How he wants to take us out. The strategies he uses. And how to resist him. So, be on guard. Join the fight. This is... Amen. Good morning, everybody. I'm, uh, I'm really excited to be here uh, in the last installment of our Spiritual Warfare series. And I would encourage you, I believe that all these messages have been real powerful. Spiritual Warfare is a real thing. And, and uh, if you missed a week or didn't get to hear a message, go back in this, in this uh, portion of the book of Matthew and, uh, and re-listen to, the, or listen to that sermon. Or even re-listen to it. Take some, some new notes. Maybe God's got something new for you. Um, I know we are in our Matthew installment, but I'm going to be spending most of my time in the book of Genesis chapter 22. So if you brought your brick and mortar Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 22. Uh, I'm only going to be reading one verse in the book of Matthew, and that'll be on the screen for you. So feel free to to, uh, land there. Um, But I just wanted to recap a little bit uh, just to just to as we end this series. Um, So before this whole spiritual warfare thing starts with Jesus and Satan, Jesus is baptized by John the Baptist. He gets baptized. And after that happens, the Bible says that the heavens opened up. The heavens parted. You see heaven. And it says the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus like a dove. And, and God the Father says, this is my son who I love so much. This is my son who I am in love with. I love my son. And it's so interesting because it says right after God the Father says, this is my son who I love. It says that the Holy Spirit then sent Jesus off to be tempted. That does not seem like those two phrases go from one. I don't know how you get from that sentence to the next one. It doesn't seem like it makes sense. God loves his son so much that he sent him off to be tempted by Satan. And then, as we've heard these last few weeks, uh, Jesus fasted for 40 days. He didn't eat for 40 days, and he spent that time with his heavenly Father, but he also spent that time being tempted by Satan. Three different times, Satan tempted him, trying to, trying to give, uh, give, give Jesus something so he could take away everything else that Jesus had, that Jesus was, a, was here for. He was trying to take away the mission that um, Jesus was here for. And then in, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 11, It says that the devil then left him because he wasn't successful. The devil then left him and the angels came and attended to him. And I just I just keep getting to that. And I keep thinking like, well, why did God the father allow that to happen in the first place? And maybe some of you guys and myself are in this room thinking, why did God let me go through this? Why did God allow this temptation to come to me? Right, Because the Bible makes it clear that this Satan can't do anything without God's approval. So why would God have allowed Jesus to be tempted? He's never sinned. He was perfect. I get it. I'm a sinner. Maybe I deserve it. But God, Jesus never sinned, and God still let him be tempted, let him face trials in his life. Why is that? And I think it's because God is always calling us higher to higher heights. He's calling us to, to different places that, that he's set aside for us that without those things, without experiencing that, we would not be able to get there. In fact, God puts it this way in the Bible. It says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, 
so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And that's so true is that as we're ascending, as we're pursuing the direction God's calling us to go to, the enemy is always going to be in the midst of it. The enemy is always going to try to give us altitude sickness and keep us from the direction that God's got in store for us. And I think that even in this story that we just heard about in the book of Matthew, where Jesus faced three temptations and he passed them all, he succeeded. And now he's at this point where the devil left him. I don't even know how I would feel if I was in that situation. Let's say you or myself were successful in in uh, whatever the, the schemes of the enemy were. We were on that mountain. We fasted for 40 days. We resisted the devil three times. And then we're here. And it doesn't always feel like our situation has changed at all. We, we fought the devil, but not, we're still at the same spot that we were. It's kind of like, have you guys ever been on the, one of those treadmills that's got that TV screen on it nowadays? And you can go and you can hike up the Grand Canyon from your treadmill. And so you, and you, you do it, you're online, so you can see other people are hiking up the Grand Canyon that day, and you can see their, their, uh, their success. So if you're running, you'll pass them. If you're walking, somebody will pass you. And, you know, as, as you're going up, it'll, the, the incline will go higher, the incline will go lower, whatever you're doing. But then you get off the treadmill, physically and mentally exhausted, and you realize you are no diff- you're at the exact same location as where you started. Nothing changed. I think that a lot of times that's what the enemy tries to do to each one of us is he tries to give us this mental exhaustion of, man, you're struggling with this. And he just keeps flooding our minds and flooding our calendars and flooding everything he can to try and get us mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually exhausted to the point where we start asking ourselves, why is this happening to me? It doesn't seem like God is doing anything in the midst of this chaos. That's what the enemy wants you to believe because he wants you to stop climbing. He wants you to stop elevating. He wants you to stop rising. He wants you to stop increasing. And so we're going to read a story that in the book of Genesis about a guy named Abraham and about his ascension. He actually climbs up a physical mountain. And we're going to look at, at that story. And we're going to see that God is actually calling him to make sacrifices And God's actually going to call us to make sacrifices. This isn't going to be a super crazy happy message. This is a message where God's calling us to something higher, right? It's not the message where we get to go into a dark room and sleep for 365 straight days. I wish I could give you guys that message. I really do. But that's not the message I'm here talking about today. And what we're going to learn is that elevation, going higher, requires sacrifice, increase requires some decrease in your life. We have to decrease so that God can increase in our life. And we're going to read the story of Abraham in Genesis chapter 22. And actually, if, if right before verse 1, there's a headline in your Bible. And it's actually the headline of this is, Abraham is tested. And I know that when we hear that word tested, we think of it as a very negative thing. In high school, you definitely think of it as a very negative thing, tested. In life, you really, a lot of times, we, when we hear that we're being tested, it, it almost feels like a punishment. It almost feels like someone doesn't trust us, and they need to know if we're legit or not. It, it almost feels like a very negative thing, but that's not how God sees a test. That's not how God sees a trial. God didn't put Jesus in a trial, in a temptation situation, because he didn't trust him. It's, it's almost like when you're 15 or 16 years old, whatever the age is now, when you get your learner's permit to drive a car, and you have to drive with your parent in the, in the passenger seat, so you can't take anyone out on a date because your parent would be in the car with you. And, and then you get to the point after driving for so many hours and logging those hours and studying that book that they give you for your, uh, for your exam that you get to take a test to see if you are, are good enough to get a promotion Or if you need a little bit more time in this area. And I think that's a lot of times how God sees tests in our life. He says, you have been spending time in my word. You have been been fighting on your knees in prayer. 
and I'm ready to take you somewhere else. I'm ready for you to get to this next height in your life, in your relationship with me. And we should see tests from the Lord as a good thing, not as a bad thing. And so we're going to read about Abraham's test. And starting in, in verse 1 in chapter 22, it says, Sometime later, God tested Abraham, and he said to him, Abraham. Now, that doesn't seem like a really important word right now. We're going to come. I want you to hold on to that phrase right there. Sometime later, God tested Abraham, and he said to him, Abraham. Keep that in the back of your mind for the end of this message. So he said to him, Abraham, here I am, Abraham replied. And then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain that I will show you. And so the first thing I'd like to get us to understand from that passage is after God said to Abraham, Abraham responded with, here I am, Lord. And that when, I, when I hear that phrase, here I am, it kind of takes me back to high school or junior high when, when uh, you were in class and you had, to get in a, you had to take attendance. And so then the teacher says, Taylor, and I say, here I am. And normally when I responded, here I am, one of three things was happening. I was asleep prior to him saying, Taylor. And then I wake up and I say, here I am, I'm here. Or maybe I was just so distracted because I had not done my homework prior to that class and I was doing it at the last minute, copying off of somebody else's paper. And I said, oh, here I am, just checking to see if I got caught or something. Or maybe the third thing was something else was going on. I was thinking about the basketball game or some situation in my life and I'm just distracted and I hear him say my name and I say, oh, here I am. I think a lot of times... When we're having a conversation with, with people, or especially when we're having a conversation with God, it's really easy to disguise how we're really doing. It's really easy to say, oh, things are great today. Things are awesome today. It's not always easy to be real with, with people, and it's not always easy to be real with God. But when you are sincere and honest and real with God, that's when God hears you. God doesn't always care about the quantity. God doesn't always care if you pray for six straight hours. There's a story in the Bible of this guy named Hezekiah, and he he was told that he was going to be dying soon, and he prays a 29-word prayer, and the Lord extends his life by 15 years because of his sincerity. All throughout the Scripture, there's not that many prayers that are very long in Scripture, honestly. They're all sincere prayers. And that's when God hears you, is when you're sincere and you say, here is where I'm actually at right now, God. Do you hear me? Are you with me? I'm struggling in this. My kid is struggling with this. My marriage is struggling. This, here is where I am. Here I am, Lord. That's the first thing, is just be honest with the Lord about where you're at. And then the second portion is so interesting because the Bible, God says... There's three different translations in, in this passage. It says, God says, send your only son, Isaac, to the mountain to be sacrificed. It's interesting because that's not Abraham's only son. That's not even his only son. That was actually his second son. And another translation, it says, send your firstborn son, Isaac, which also, again, wasn't a true statement because Isaac was not his firstborn, the one that was born first, chronologically. It was his secondborn son. But if you look at at the Hebrew word and what is it actually, what is God actually saying? What he's saying here is send your uniquely promised son to the mountain. Right? A lot of times, a lot of times what we try to give God is our own achievement. We say, God, look at what I'm doing. I'm working so hard. I'm... I'm, I'm doing all these things. You should be so proud of me. I got to have a conversation the other day with a friend of mine. He, uh, he is a believer, and he's trying to reach one of his friends who's not a believer. And he told me, he said that, he said, you know, he, uh, whenever I talk to him, he's always telling me, like, well, if, if I was going to be a Christian, I'd have to get rid of this, and I'd have to do this, and I'd have to accomplish that, and I'd have to do this, and I'd have to give, give up this thing in my life and and I struggle with this sin and what his response to 
to that person was was so powerful. He said, you know what? That's not what you need. You need a relationship. And if you have a relationship with Jesus, everything is just, everything's going to change. Your mindset is going to change. Like, you don't have to get yourself cleaned up before you get to the relationship. And so what, what Abraham might feel like is he, he might think, I have to give my, my son that uh, I worked so hard to achieve rather than the one that God just gave me. But God is saying, take the thing that I gave you. You don't have to, you don't have to work to achieve it. I'm, I'm, I'm working on your behalf. And maybe a, maybe a better way to describe it is, is that next portion. God says, go to the mountain that I will show you. That's what it says at the end of that, of that passage that we just read. God says, go to the mountain that I will show you. How often do we try to climb up our own mountains, the mountain of success, the mountain of status, the mountain of career, the mountain of achievement. We try, to, we try to climb our own mountains, the mountains that God's not calling us to climb. We're trying to climb the, the things that we think we need to climb. Maybe we say, God, I'm going to climb the mountain of financial breakthrough right now, which is not a bad thing. I'm not telling you that that's a bad thing. But maybe what God says is, you don't need that right now. That's coming. But first, I need you to climb the mountain of marriage breakthrough before you get to this one. But eventually, we'll, we'll be climbing a mountain on our own, and we start asking ourselves, God, where are you? And God's telling us, that's not where I called you to be. And so I want to challenge you guys, as you go through your calendar, as you go through your schedule, as you look at the things you're doing in your daily life, are these the places that God's calling you to spend your time? Are these the things that God's calling you to do? And in those moments, whether it's work, whether it's a hobby, whether it's whatever, are you using those moments to glorify God? Are you using those, those hobbies? Are you using your marriage? Are you using every area of your life to say, man, I'm going to give this to the Lord? Or are we just doing it for our own, own glory, to gain what we can out of it? Are we climbing the mountain that God is calling us to do? And after we, after we hear from the Lord, this is where God's calling me to go, then we need to start preparing. Because if after this service, one of you asks me to go climb the highest mountain at Obachi, I'm going to be bringing a picnic basket I'm going to be bringing sunscreen, sunglasses, and a selfie stick. But if after church, one of you asks me to go climb Mount Everest, I will not be bringing any of those things. I will be bringing a whole new set of gear. I will be working out, trying to get prepared for this journey. And my preparation is going to look a lot differently based off of the direction I'm being asked to go. And I think that we need to first ask ourselves, God, where are you calling me to? And not just try and pursue something on our own. God, where are you calling me to, and what do I need to accomplish it? And God kind of gives us that in this next passage. It goes on, and, and if we continue, it says, Early the next morning. That is so important. I'll get, come back to that. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac, who he would sacrifice. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up to the place in the distance and said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. That first portion of that story is, is kind of crazy if you think about it. It says early the next morning, right after he got this commandment from the Lord, early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey and started heading out. If, if this was the story of Taylor, it would have said early the next morning, Taylor got up and rebuked the Lord and would have had 50 different conversations with his Christian brothers about, the, about what he had heard. Taylor would have said, there's no way that God told me to do that. Will you, will you pray for me? Because I feel like I'm being spiritually attacked right now by the devil. Will you, will, because I think that one thing that the enemy knows is that when, when somebody goes in to buy a car, 
Every car salesman knows that the quicker you can make the sale, the more likely it is to happen. The longer it takes for myself and the car dealer to sell me the car, the more likely I am to say no. And the enemy knows that principle as well because he knows that on, from, from the moment you hear about your mountain, that God is call, the destination God is calling you to go to, and the breakthrough, in the middle of that, the enemy's number one goal is to put delay in the middle. He's trying to get you to ask questions and say, God didn't tell me to do this, did he? Abraham acted immediately. He said, I'm, I'm, I'm placing my faith in, in, in my heavenly father, and I am going to be faithful, and I'm going to trust him. Because it's so easy. It's so easy to, to, to just not, it's, what did I have? It's going to be easy to get talked out of the things that God is calling you to do if you delay it. If you put a delay in the destination and the breakthrough, it's so easy for the enemy to beat you. It's so easy to get defeated. And it's okay to not always understand why you're going through some of the things you're going through. If you're, the Bible describes God as a good heavenly father. And so if you're a parent in this room, I'm sure you understand that principle. That your kids in the moment might not understand why they need to eat their vegetables or why they need to learn what good work ethic is. But if they're faithful and they do some of the things that you tell them to do, some of the things, I know, parents, it can be really tough. If they're faithful and they, and they trust you, then they're going to come to a moment where they say, you know what, I didn't understand it then. But I know my parents had their best interests, my best interests at heart. That they, they, they knew what was best for me, even if I didn't understand why I was doing it in the moment. And I think the same principle is true with God. Abraham did not understand why he needed to sacrifice his son. Because God had actually promised him that his son was going to be, the, he was going to be a father of many nations. And you can only be a father of many nations if you have a son that you can c carry on your lineage. And he was being asked to sacrifice that. But the, here's, the point, here's the important thing is if God made you a promise, he's going to be faithful to complete it. You don't need to worry about the things God has made a promise to you about. If God, if God said it, he will do it. He is faithful. He will accomplish what he said he is going to accomplish. We don't need to fear what God is calling us to get rid of. So the next part of that story, they kind of get to this portion where they're, they're, they're doing a little climbing, but then they have to get to the, the real climbing. They're getting close to the top. And Abraham, he looks at his servants and his donkey, and he says, I need to leave these, I need to leave these guys behind so that I can, I can go higher. I'm going to take the wood, I'm going to take the knife, and I'm going to take my son, and I'm going to leave these things behind. And I think it's so interesting because if any of you guys are, are interested in watching, if you, any of you watch any documentaries about people who climb Mount Everest or climb other places, you'll see that um, normally they'll go with a couple friends. It's not normally just one guy who's climbing Everest. They'll normally go with a, a one or two or three other people and then a guy who's leading them. But at the bottom of that mountain, those guys are making jokes they're talking, they're having a lot of fun, they're pulling pranks on one another, they're, they're just enjoying themselves, they're having a grand old time. But when they get to the, about the middle of the mountain, then they start, you don't hear them talking as much, because there's not as much oxygen in the air. They actually start, they, they have to start focusing on their breathing, they have to start doing breathing techniques Things in their life have to change when they get higher up the mountain than when they started at the bottom of the mountain. And I, I, that's, that's another principle that can be really hard is, is as we go where God is calling us to go, he's going to be asking for a lot of sacrifice. This is a, I can't really sugarcoat it. God is going to ask for sacrifice. He's going to ask for us to change our habits. He's going to ask us to 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 transform our mind. He's going to ask a lot of things out of us that are going to have to change if we're going to go higher, if we're going to go to a different destination that God's called for us, but it's a better destination. It's better to go higher, but it costs us something. It's always going to cost us something. And so then he's, he, he makes this decision that he needs to leave these servants and the donkey behind, and what his, his response to them was, is 
my son and I are going to go and worship, and then we will come back to you. You guys stay put. My son and I are going to go and worship. And what he's going to do is he's going to make a sacrifice. He's, going, he's originally planning on going to sacrifice his son. And what he's saying is, is the word worship and the word sacrifice go hand in hand. There's not one person on this staff at FCC. There's not one elder and one deacon, one anybody. Who's, there's not a person on this, in this church who has served, attended one and served one, who hasn't had to make sacrifice in their life. If you're involved in any sort of ministry, if you're ministering to your, your coworker, it costs you something. Ministry worship and ministry sacrifice are the exact same thing. All, but all God is asking for, he's not asking for you to, to always have this 100% six success rate. He's not saying, hey, I want you to go have this conversation, and if, if they don't make a decision to follow Jesus right there, you failed. He's just asking you to be faithful. And you're not always going to succeed at that. You're going to fail at that a lot. I fail at that a lot. I'll give you a, a really easy example of that. There's, there's thousands of them. Uh, there's something that's going on today. The student ministry tonight at youth group, we will be having our first live worship session that we, that since in my time that we've ever had. We've never had live worship. And that is zero credit to me. Because six months ago, Eli Engel came up to me and he said, you know, Taylor, I think that if we, if we did live worship rather than worship on the screen with the speakers and the, the lyrics on the screen with just a, a person singing on the computer, it would be a, it, that, that God would honor that, that God would actually move through, through us singing. And I never technically told him no. So <laughs> I just said, I don't think it's possible to do that. I gave him a lot of reasons. I put that delay, I put the excuses in the middle of the mountain and the breakthrough. I said, Eli, you know what? You could fill two internets with what I don't know about technology, right? Like, I don't know anything about the technology. I mean, I know how to turn the lights on, and I know how to turn the sound on, and that's about it. So I don't know how it all even works. I said, I don't know what technology is, is working. I don't know what technology is broken that we would need to replace. I don't know if we can get Sidney Vitz to sing for us. I don't, there's a lot of questions I've got. I don't know if we could get a technology team. I don't know if we, could, I don't know if we know anybody who can play instruments. I mean, I, I really don't know if we could make any of this happen. I don't know if we could coordinate schedules to make it work. Eli did all of it. Eli did all of that. He said, this is the mountain. This is where God's calling me to. I'm not going to put a delay on it. I'm going to be faithful. And because of his faithfulness, we're having a live worship experience. Can we give him a round of applause? Because he's in the room. That's awesome. He said, forget Taylor. I'll just do it. God told me to do it. I'll do it. It doesn't matter. Worship costs you something. Worship costs. Worship takes sacrifice. But you're going to see if you're worshiping, if you're, following, if you're following Jesus, if you're climbing up that mountain, anytime you're climbing a mountain, your vision changes. For, for a while, you, you can only see trees. And then you go a little higher, and you can just see over the trees. And then you get to the top of, mount, top of the mountain, and you can see everything. And you'll start to see that the things that you thought were impossible are totally feasible because God's involved in it. The things you thought could not happen, happen. Because you get, a, you get a fresh perspective. You get a fresh vision. Because that's what God gives you as you climb higher, as you go higher in your relationship with him. Uh, the story goes on, and I'm going to read a lot here. Um, so just, just bear with me. It goes on, and it says, As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son. Abraham replied, the fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered him and said, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they, sorry, when they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. 
But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, Lord. Just like we heard at the very beginning of that story. Here I am, Lord, he replied. Do not lay a hand on this boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place Jehovah Jireh or the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring, nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. So here's something really interesting is that I told you to remember at the very beginning, it started off with God saying, Abraham. And Abraham said, here I am. And God gave him the directions. You're going to go to the mountain that I'm going to show you, and you're going to sacrifice your son. So from the first Abraham to the second Abraham, where he gets to spare his son. In between that, those two moments, there is no words said from God the Father to Abraham. God never speaks to Abraham in the middle of his mountain climb. He never, he never you know, you would have hoped that he could have given him a little encouragement. You can do it. You can do it. You can do it. Nothing. God never spoke to him one time. Between the first Abraham and the second Abraham, God said nothing. But because he was faithful, because he heard God, and because he didn't delay it, and because he acted with faith and trust that the Lord knew what he was doing, he named the mountain Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord will provide. And this is so cool because we can pray. I mean, a lot. Of, I'm sure we pray. And there's moments where we hear from the Lord we'll hear God say that he's going to do something. And it's so amazing and so powerful when you hear God speak to you and say, I am going to do this in your life. But when you are faithful and say, I don't understand it, it doesn't make any sense to me, but God told me to do it, I'm going to be faithful, I'm going to climb the mountain, we don't just get to hear the miracle, we get to see the miracle. We get to see the Lord provide We get to see God make a way even when there isn't a way. And it's so much more powerful when you get to see the fulfillment come to pass. But it requires us to be faithful. It requires us to say, yes, Lord, I trust you. I'm going to be faithful when you call me to. I'm not just going to let you tell me the miracle. I'm going to let you show me the miracle as well. It's so much more powerful when we let God show us than just tell us. But when you're in the middle of climbing the mountain, the enemy's only goal is to give you altitude sickness, to get you to to get you to quit. He's going to say anything he can. He's going to tell you he's going to tell you so many things. He's going to tell you there's no hope in this situation. You may as well stop because you're not making it to the top. He's going to tell you to look back down because that's the direction you need to start heading. He's going to tell you that you you you've you've gained a lot of success. You just let's just cash out. You've you've learned a lot. God's given you God's given you some wisdom. He's given you some practical tools. You don't need to keep climbing. Just take the wins that you've already received and go back down. But most importantly, He's going to be trying to tell you that you don't you're not hearing from God. God is not with you in the middle of your battles right now. God's not with you in the midst of this journey. God said Abraham, but He hasn't said anything since. And I just want to go real quick as we as we wrap up. This is the same thing happened in Jesus' life. Jesus had a moment where that happened to him. And it, was, it happened in this, in the, it's called the Garden of Gethsemane. It was the night before everything starts to go down where Jesus is going to be crucified. Jesus has one last conversation. He has his first Abraham moment. 
He says, he, says he, he gets to hear from God. He says, God, I know what's about to happen to me. I know that I'm about to be put on a cross, and I do not want this to happen. If there's any other way, please make that way happen. But if this is the only way, I will be faithful, and I will trust you to the end. And that was the last conversation we hear between him and his heavenly father. He, he, the, next, the next time we hear from him, Jesus is getting beaten nearly to death with, with nails and shards of glass and whips and everything. He's getting beaten nearly to death. And there's no re- moment where we hear God the Father say anything to Jesus. And then they make him carry this wooden cross and they nail him to it. And he says something really powerful. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in that moment, it sounds like Jesus is saying, God, where are you? God, what's going on? But this is the cool part. I want to go back to that Matthew chapter 4, that, that spiritual warfare story we've been talking about these last few weeks. What Jesus did every single time when Satan tempted him was he, he needed to respond with Scripture. So the first time he says, here's some bread. And or take, make some, create some bread and eat it. And Jesus responds with scripture. And then Satan says, hey, I'll give you dominion over the world. And, say, and Jesus responds with scripture because that's what he needed to do. And then he gets tempted a third time and Jesus again responds with scripture. Jesus was at his boiling point. He was at the end of everything he could muster up. And he doesn't say, God, you are not with me. He quotes scripture again. What he actually did was he quoted a verse in the Old Testament. And I'm going to read you that passage. It's from Psalm chapter 22. I'm not going to read the whole psalm, but I'm going to read the very beginning of this psalm. And then I'm going to read the very end of this psalm. Now remember, psalms are basically just journal. And it's somebody's journal. And so this person, you're going to see just from having a conversation with God and being honest with God and being real with where he's at, you're going to see... The, the heart change that this guy has in one journal entry. This is not two journal entries separate. This is the same journal entry. Psalm chapter 22, verses 1 through 2. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Just like Jesus said. Why are you so far from saving me? So far from my cries of anguish. My God, I cry out by day, but you don't answer. By night, but I find no rest. That's how the psalm starts. That's how the journal entry starts, and this is how it finishes. I will declare your name to my people in the assembly. I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. He's listening to you right now. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him. Those who cannot keep themselves alive. When we pass away, we get to kneel before Jesus. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. When you are in the middle of elevating, of rising, of going to the heights that God has called you, you might not always hear him, but he is at the top and he's waiting for you. He's got his, he's got a second Abraham moment for you and he's got something for you that you could not have ever imagined. And all it takes is a little bit of faith. It just takes a little bit of faith. It just takes you to say, God, I don't understand it. It doesn't make sense, but I'm here. I'm going to be faithful. Because just like we read in Matthew chapter 4, then the devil left him and the angels came and attended to him. The devil can't win. 
if you stay faithful. He can't win if you stay faithful. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for today. God, you are so powerful. God, I know that some of us in this room are are struggling. We're battling things that it doesn't always make sense why we have to go through it. But you know why. Your ways are higher than our ways. Your thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And God, I just pray that we can self-analyze and say, God, these things can go. These, I can cut these things out of my life because I want to elevate higher. I want more of you and I want less of me. And God, as we do that, you're going to be faithful as well because you've got something in store for us that we could not have imagined. So God, I just, I just pray in this moment, God, you speak to each person individually in this room. God, you tell them what they need to hear. God, what you're doing in their life. And God, I pray that you bless each one of us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's worship.